have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33, verse 18. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on him, I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this time. Thank you for each one that has come this morning. Pray your blessing as we look into your word together. Father, may your word impact our lives. May you illuminate us and help us to grow because of what you have taught us. So, Father, we thank you for this passage of scripture. Thank you for the time that you've given to us to look into these things. And thank you for the many blessings that you have given. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we continue toward the end of the book of Exodus, we have definitely seen God at work uh, right from the beginning. This book has been centered on God's sovereignty, that is, that God is in control. We saw how terrible life was for Israel, how the slavery was getting worse by the year, and that even as Moses begins to speak to Pharaoh, it gets even worse. And yet through that, God is sovereign. We saw how through the escape from Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, the miracles of water and food, protection in battle, that God was indeed in control. And here, even though Israel had sinned uh, with this golden calf, God was in control of that situation. God was never at a moment where he had to wonder at what to do. God, in his infinite knowledge, had the perfect plan. We've come to a place here in chapter 33 where God has brought judgment upon the nation. They have greatly disobeyed God. And so Moses, on behalf of the people, has been pleading for them. And God accepts that plea. He accepts that prayer and God answers that prayer. And so we have God being sovereign and God also answering prayer. Now three weeks ago, we started this chapter. And we started with the good news. Israel was still going to enjoy the blessings of the land of promise. A land flowing with milk and honey where they could thrive and serve the Lord. God was still upholding his promises, even though Israel had broken theirs. And though the punishments dealt out were bad, there was still hope. We then saw Israel's, Israel's repentance in verses 4 through 6. As a nation, Israel would repent of their sin and seek God's forgiveness. Thirdly, we had Moses' tent in verses 7 through 11. This is the place where God and Moses would speak, and the tent was placed outside of the camp, showing the brokenness of Israel, Israel's relationship with God. And then two weeks ago, we looked at the fourth thing in this chapter, God's presence renewed. There were three aspects that we studied. First was the grace of God. Secondly, the presence of God. And thirdly, the knowledge of God. And so this morning we're going to finish this chapter. But this morning it is on one aspect, and that of God's glory. In verse 17, we found God agreeing to Moses that he would still lead the people through the promised land. Moses' plea with God was just that, that God would continue to lead the nation. Moses understood that it was God's leading that set them apart from the other nations. It was God's presence that gave Israel power and confidence, and it was God's leading that showed these other nations who the true God is. And so God agrees. He keeps that promise of leading the people. It was Moses' understanding of God's grace, and Moses' closeness to the Lord that brings about answered prayer. 
God answers prayer. And the closer we are to God, the more effective our prayers are. The closer to God we are, the more our prayers are in line with his will. And God answers according to his will. It isn't the more fervent we pray, the more God will bless in some prosperous way. That, that's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying that the closer we are to God, the, the closer we are to praying according to his will and seeing what he wants done. And so Moses then again pleads with God. He asks to be shown God's glory. The word glory here is the word splendor. It speaks of honor and majesty and even wealth. Uh, the word is used speaking of Solomon's great wealth. And God responds, he tells Moses that he would grant that request. He says that he would allow Moses to see God's glory in some form. The word used here is the word goodness. It describes the beauty of God. When the Old Testament was translated into Greek, they used the word doxa, which is the New Testament form of the word glory. It speaks of God's manifest goodness. What it tells us is that God's glory encompasses all of God's attributes. In fact, we see God's grace and mercy and compassion intertwined in these verses. God's glory could be defined as the, as the magnificence of who God is. The glory of God is the totality of all of God's attributes, his characteristics, from his great love to his wrath, from righteousness and holiness to forgiveness and long-suffering. But in verse 20, God gives a caveat. He, he says, I will pass before you, but you cannot see my face, or else you will die. And so God tells Moses that he will place him in the cleft of a rock. And as God passes by, he will cover Moses. God will pass over, and Moses will be able to see the back of God. Moses is given a great privilege here. And we find that Moses does not describe this event after we read this. Now the cleft of a rock is basically an opening within a mountain. Often small birds like doves will nest within these areas. And here Moses will be placed within. So there are three aspects of this that I want to look at this morning. The first thing is the rock. A rock is a symbol of strength, depend dependability, and trust. We read in Psalm 18, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. David here is praising God and exclaims that he loves the Lord. He calls God his strength, his rock, his deliverer, and, and so on. We read of other adjectives throughout the Psalms like anchor and shield, buckler. What we find is safety and strength here. The same is true of Moses, where God protects him from his glory, shields him from it, and Moses is protected. In Habakkuk 1.12, we read this. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O rock, have established them for reproof. It's an interesting verse. It begins with this question. The author says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God? See, God is an everlasting God. He is forever. The answer is, of course, God is from everlasting. He has always existed. Before time began, there was God. God will always exist. But the key is found later in the verse where the words, O rock, are found. In the King James, you see the words, O mighty God, and you may have a little note that says Hebrew rock. It is the same word for rock that is used in our passage in Exodus. I took Daniel uh, with me to pick up Andrew and Josh from the Mapleton Bridge from school on Friday, I believe it was. And as Daniel was throwing rocks in the river, he found this one rock that he really wanted to throw in there. And he grabs the rock and he starts tugging at the rock and it would not budge. It wouldn't move at all for him. He could spend the whole afternoon if he wanted trying to move it, but it wasn't going anywhere. God cannot be moved. He is sturdy and he is steadfast. The great part about God being the rock is that we can lean on him. 
We can trust him. We can depend on him. We don't have to worry about whether God will break a promise or what to do in a trial because God is our rock. While the stormy waves may crash, the rock is never moved. He is our rock, and on him we depend. The second aspect is that of no, one, no man has seen God. We looked at this a little bit a couple of weeks ago when we discussed that Moses and God spoke face to face. In verse 20, God expresses this thought that no one can see God and still live. One author described the event in this way. Quote, Moses is to see the afterglow, which is a reliable indication of what the full splendor is to be. Moses is not able to see God in all of his glory, or else Moses would die. And so God covers Moses and allows Moses to catch a glimpse of God's glory. This is why Moses is placed into the cleft of the rock, and God covers his eyes until after he has passed. And then Moses sees the afterglow, the back of God. Now there were moments in scripture where we see God visiting certain people, and they did not die. We see that God's glory is veiled in those moments, just as with Moses here. In 1 Timothy 6.16, we read, Who alone has immortality? Who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see? To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. In John 1.18, no, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And so we understand that no one can see God in all of his glory, or else they would die. I don't want to spend a lot of time in this passage, uh, but Judges 13 is a very interesting portion of Scripture. It opens with Israel's status. Now, you may remember the book of Judges is all about Israel's up-and-down process, and we kind of see that in Exodus too. But Israel would have these down periods where they weren't serving the Lord, and in those times they were oppressed by different nations surrounding them. And then God would send a judge after Israel would plead, please God, send somebody to save us. God would send a judge, and they would serve the Lord for a time. Then they would fall back into sin. There was this up and down process, this cycle that would continue. And in Judges 13, we're in the midst of this cycle. They're under the oppression of the Philistines for 40 years. There is a man in the opening verses named Manoah. His wife was unable to have children. In verse 3, the angel of the Lord appears before his wife and tells her that she will have a baby, and he will be special. He will be a judge. The woman, Manoah's wife, is astonished and amazed and rushes to her husband to tell him what has happened. And as she explains this to Manoah, she tells him that this uh, guy had the countenance, had the features of an angel. Manoah prays to the Lord and asks for this man or angel to come again, and God does. In verse 9, the angel returns. Manoah greets the angel. The angel repeats the message regarding the pregnancy. It turns out this pregnancy will be the man, Samson, that will be born. In verse 15, Manoah uh, invites this angel to stay and have dinner. And it's this invitation that reveals to Manoah who this really is. The angel says, look, I'm not going to eat with you, but make an offering to the Lord. Manoah asks for the name of this man. The angel says, it is secret. Manoah makes an offering. This angel begins to ascend back up to heaven from the flame, from the offering. And at that moment, Manoah and his wife fall to the ground. And it's in verse 21 that realization hits them that they had been visited by God himself. Their response was an understanding that they were facing death. The realization of death shows who this angel really is. What's interesting in this passage is that when asked of this angel's name, the angel says, my name is secret. And that word secret is the same word used in Isaiah 9, 6, describing Jesus as wonderful, counselor, mighty God. That word wonderful is the same word used. What is clear here is that some people were given the blessing of seeing some aspect of God. We looked a couple of weeks ago, very briefly, we mentioned Abraham and Gideon and Joshua and many others who had similar experiences. And so no one has seen God in all his glory. We read in Hebrews chapter 1, 
that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is speaking of Jesus, that Jesus is God. It was Jesus who says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And so what we find is that Jesus... Uh, at times through the Old Testament would come and visit upon people in a pre-incarnate form. And he veils his glory in those moments. We know that as Jesus lives on the earth for 33 years, he veiled his glory so that he could live among us. And he did. So it raises this question to our third point. What is the glory of God? It's a little bit hard to pin down an exact definition but the glory of God could be defined as the beauty of his spirit. And it is the beauty that emanates from his character. John Piper defined glory in this way. The glory of God is the manifest beauty of his holiness. He uses Isaiah chapter 6 as an example. Uh, quoting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The next thing he says is this, the whole earth is full of his. You might have expected him to say holiness. But he doesn't say that. He says, glory. John Piper also says this as a definition. Quote, the glory of God is the infinite beauty and greatness of God's manifold perfections. As we said at the beginning, it is the totality of God's attributes. That is the glory of God. And so with those definitions in mind, let's look at this verse in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. It's a very common verse that's speaking about this topic. <clears throat> In light of the previous verses, that all of creation screams out, it declares, it preaches the glory of God. The stars and the moon, the water, the plants and the animals, and the very creation of the human being points to the glory of God. One of the purposes of the Christian is to glorify the Lord, to magnify his glory. We read in 1 Corinthians 10.31, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. No matter what we do, God's glory should be at the forefront. Quote, giving glory to God is ascribing to him his full recognition. It is the idea of giving to God all of the credit. And when we give God glory, we are giving him the recognition, the credit. It is God who deserves it all. Warren Wearsby said this, The best remedy for a broken heart is a new vision of the glory of God. What he's saying is that the more we focus upon God and his glory, the more we think of who God is and all he is, the less our struggles will affect us. The problem in today's society, even among Christian circles, is a lack of giving God glory. I want to close with this excerpt. Quote, This is the mistake many people continue to make Trusting in earthly things, earthly relationships, their own powers or talents or beauty, or the goodness they see in others. But when those things fade and fail as they will inevitably do, these people despair. What we all need to realize is that God's glory is constant. And as we journey through life, we will see it manifest here and there in this person, or that forest, or in a story of love or heroism, fiction or nonfiction, or our own personal lives. But it all goes back to God in the end. And the only way to God is through his son, Jesus Christ. We will find the very source of all beauty in him, in heaven, if we were in Christ. Nothing will be lost to us. All those things that faded in life, we will find again in him. And so to God be the glory. Amen and amen. Father, thank you for your glory. And Father, I pray that in every aspect of our lives, you would have all the glory. Father, thank you for sending the Lord Jesus. Thank you for veiling his glory that we may live. So, Father, help us to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim your glory, and to show your glory to our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name.